Annyeong! Welcome to Delightful! What do you say we kick off Stockbox Season 2? That's right, it's once again time to hit the ground running and bring new life to discarded toys and scrapped projects. This is how it works. We grab a Junker doll from the stock box, and with no planning or forethought whatsoever, we dive in and create a fully fleshed out character. It can go smoothly, there can be mistakes, but either way, it's a fun creative exercise. What better way to start off than by completing the failed Moth Girl from last time? I'm pretty sure she's in here somewhere. If I didn't get around to finishing her, it would have bothered me forever, so let's make her the first episode of Stockbox Season 2. Ah yes, I finished the reroute and then changed my mind. Like so many projects, I left the poor thing in pieces. Well, let's see if we have better luck this time. To the work table! Seeing as how I blew it on the color scheme last time I made the clothes, I thought I'd play it safe and stick to a simple color palette. Yellow and purple. Complementary colors. I already plugged a couple pink and green streaks into her hair, so those can be small accent colors. But for the most part, I want purple to dominate. I decided I'd make her a simple sundress and pair it with a fluffy, puffy jacket to evoke a cute, fuzzy moth. The sundress pattern is pretty easy, basically a lined bodice connected to a circle skirt. I chose this one because it doesn't have any sleeves, which will make wearing her jacket a lot easier. The pattern calls for a whopping 78 centimeter strip of continuous fabric for the skirt ruffle, and I don't have enough fabric for that. Do I have any purple lace that would work instead? No. Well, I guess I'll patch strips of fabric together until I reach 78 centimeters then. I went back and forth with a slightly different purple fabric because I just didn't have enough of the magenta stuff, and hopefully the color variation will look cool. With all the pattern pieces cut, I sew up the side seams and line the sweetheart bodice. After running a gathering stitch down the ruffle, I scrunch it up to match the circumference of the skirt. Then I pin it down. I pin the ruffle down on both ends first and then in the middle. If you section it off like this, you can get the ruffles distributed more evenly around the circle without too much finagling and repinning. Flip the ruffles pretty side out. Ta-da! As I was sewing, I started thinking this looks too plain. I know I said I wanted a simple color palette, but that's a lot of purple. Suddenly struck with inspiration, I opened up Photoshop and drew up these eye-like jewel designs. Eyes, because moths have eye-like patterns on their wings, you know, and jewels because... pretty. I printed them out on my last scrap of fabric transfer paper. I actually taped it to a sheet of printer paper to feed it through my machine, and I can't believe that worked. I cut them out and placed them around the skirt. And yeah, looks like I drastically overestimated how many I'd need. Then I just follow the instructions. Peel off the back, cover, and press with a hot iron. There we go! Back to the table. I knew I wanted a pretty lace design, but exacto knifing delicate lace patterns out of paper sounds like a nightmare, so I figured I'd just paint it on instead. I draw a mock-up in pencil. That looks good. Then brush the design on with white acrylic paint. I was having fun and feeling it, so I mixed up a light pink too, and filled in some of the negative space and added dots. Pretty fancy looking, right? And at last we can finish sewing the dress together. Add a strip of velcro on the back, and it's done! Now for the coat! I'm going to modify the oversized hoodie pattern I have for this one. Basically, I ended up leaving off the hood and cutting the front and side pieces in half to form a crop top jacket. I wanted something a little fluffier than this fabric, but my fluffier fabric was off-white, and this stark white matches the lace pattern on her dress, so I guess it'll do. 
This item of clothing is pretty simple too, just four pieces. Sew front to back at the shoulder seam, attach the sleeves, then zip up the side seam. We're not done with the fuzzy fabric yet though. Besides the antenna and wings, one of the mothiest things I can think of is that super poofy ring of fur around a moth's neck, like it's wearing a cozy scarf. So I sewed a tube of fabric, stuffed it, and added snaps to get this. What do we do about shoes? Hmm, I found these relatively simple white shoes that should match with a little paint. They're mermaid themed though, which, although adorable, doesn't match our moth. I cut down the fins and shave off the details until we have a simple pair of pearlescent pumps. Let's paint those soles, you guessed it, purple. Two layers should do. How about cloth wings for the shoes to make them fancier? I paint glue onto the last remaining scrap of purple fabric, then cut out two tiny wings. The glue helps keep the fabric from unraveling. A little paint detail, and hot glue them to the shoes. Oh, that's cute! I kind of have a pair of shoes like this, actually. <laughs> After trying them on the doll, though, they just don't pop, do they? I love a pearl finish, but it sort of gets lost and blends in with the yellow skin, doesn't it? Well, I had a thought. What if her shoes are also fuzzy? Would that be weird? Furry shoes? Oh, why not? Let's try it. Oh my gosh, plush pumps! I love them! Pop the wings back on and the shoes are good to go. We're on a roll. How about a purse next? I've got a bunch of leftover jewel eyes, so I felt somewhat obligated to use more of them. What say we put a big one smack in the center of her bag? The whole purse could even be an oblong eye shape. I cut a front and back out of cardboard, then cut a rectangle of cardboard the length of the bottom. That way we glue it together to make a bag. I did use hot glue for this. I always feel bad using hot glue because we all know deep down it's not a high quality material to craft with, but it's so fast and easy. Ugh. My love-hate relationship with hot glue continues. Using jewelry fasteners, I tie one loop to a long cotton thread, then glue it to the corner of the bag. The thread goes under the bag and around the other side. This will become the strap. Let's thread a whole bunch of tiny beads on here to make it look nicer. This might take a while. Finally, tie the fastener on the end and shove the remaining tail of the thread back into the beads if you can manage it. It makes everything look clean and tidy. Next, I glue on the eye right in the center there. And add more fluff! That's right, more fluffy accessories! You can't stop me! <laughs> and her bag is done! The wings! Do you remember the wings? It took me a while to dig them up, but thankfully I still had them. Beautiful as they may be, they need to match our new moth girl, so white they must become. I was going to paint them, but when the articulated wings pass by each other, they scrape against each other slightly. See, the paint comes off pretty easily. So instead of paint, let's glue fabric on instead. I coat the wing with glue, press down one face at a time, then cut the fabric to shape. I love how the molded veins show through even under the fabric. It gives them an embossed feeling. I also like how the fabric makes the wings look heavier, just like a moth's. I enjoyed the effect of the subtle veins on the wings so much that I didn't want to cover it up, so I went with a very simple pink dot design to finish them up. Do you think it looks too minimal? Watching this back now, I wonder if I should have done a fancier eye design or something. Last accessory, her antenna. Antennae? These will be made using acrylic yarn. If you've watched doll customizing videos before, you're likely familiar with the drill. Cut lengths of yarn, brush them out with a pet brush, iron them down to bring out that silky sheen, and voila, doll hair. Although this time I'm using them for antenna, not wigs. 
Taking an unwound paper clip, I dab a small amount of glue to the tip and place it in the center of one of the wefts. Fold it in half over the wire. I thought this was going well until the glue dried and left a nasty clear yellowish color behind. You can also still clearly see the wire, which doesn't look great. So I whack them off and try again. This time placing the wire on one side of the fibers. This will be the back side. I tried to cover the remaining silver wire with paint, then cut the fluff to size. So cute! Alright, that just leaves her head, which has been sitting around for months now. I gave it a fresh rinse with soapy water just to start out with a clean surface again, then bundle the hair away behind a barrier scrap of fabric. Use pins around the hairline to make an accurate mask around the face. I used to spray sealant on the doll right away, but these days I find you can get away with nothing but bare plastic on the first layer. The pastels in particular tend to lay down well regardless, so I brush on mint green eyeshadow and purple lips. Now we can take her outside for the first layer of sealant. Don't forget to protect yourself with a filtration mask. If you ever want to know what materials and equipment I'm using, everything is listed in the description box below this video. Once the sealant is dry after a good 30 minutes, it's time to continue. I start off by scratching in some rough lines in a magenta pencil. The original doll's designers made her eyes intentionally large like an insect, so I want to keep that size and give her huge, round, jewel-like eyes. I was thinking about the faceted surface of jewels and how they look similar to an insect's eyes. I also have this crazy fun pair of glasses that probably got me thinking about it. After sketching in the creases of the eyelids, some faint eyelash lines, and rough placement of the eyebrows, I switch to a deep purple and begin darkening the lines. It's always a good idea to start with a lighter color first because it's easier to erase and change your mind early on. I also block in some rough jewel tones in the eyes, such as mint green, blue, and more purple. Once the pencils feel like they've stopped building color, it's time for another spray of sealant. Think about it like making a new layer in Photoshop. The green eyeshadow on the yellow skin makes her look a bit sickly, so I'm trying to coax the color over to the blue side with some more pastel. Then it's back to building up the opacity and darkening all those lines. I tried my hand at highlighting this time around by dusting on white pastels on her forehead and below her eyes. I thought maybe a highlighting effect would help her face look more lively? I don't know. To be honest, I struggled with the yellow skin for the whole project. All I could think about was how I didn't want her to end up looking like a Simpsons character. <laughs> and now we turn to gouache paints. I mix up a couple pastel shades on the palette and start by filling in the whites of her eyes and blocking in those color blocks in the iris. Then I thought, hey, maybe I can fluff up the eyelashes with gouache too. I didn't do half bad, although they nearly got away from me. They came out a lot larger than I wanted, but hey, I guess she's just glamorous. Let's get in real close and render her jewel eyes. In my very, very short-lived career working in the games industry before I switched to YouTube full-time, I once developed an environment concept full of ice crystals and gym-like structures. I credit this project with making me buckle down and learn to draw jewels quickly. The key is to include pretty color gradients and lots of sharp contrasting edges. After all that practice of studying real photos of jewels, I find that it's not too difficult to whip one up out of my imagination these days. That's not to say her eyes are flawless. Looking at the footage now, I should have pushed the contrast more. They came out a bit dark overall. Now for the finishing touches. I dot on a small shine this time, and decided why not give her teeth. I was going for a shy smile. 
After two final layers of Mr. Super Clear sealant, paint Liquitex High Gloss Varnish on top of her irises and lips. So shiny. And that's the face up done! Now we can unmask her hair and reunite her head with her body. Maybe I should have done this before the face up. There's always a risk of damaging your paint job when cramming the head back on. I heat up the neck hole with a hair dryer first, then ease it on over the peg. Gently squeeze the temples to keep the face from distorting as you shove it back on. Give her a trim. Stab in the antenna. And our moth girl is finished! I think we'll keep the name of the original doll for her, which was Luna. I didn't drastically change anything about her. I mean, there was no sawing off of limbs this time, you know? So I feel like she still relates to her past life. I still can't decide if the color palette I chose was good or bad. I'm pretty sure I like her, but then again, I've been staring at this project for two weeks now. <laughs> I need a fresh pair of eyes on this. I wonder if going with a warmer yellow, gold, and brown family of colors would have suited this doll more. But I just love working with pastels so much! Ah, uh, well, I'm sure you'll let me know your thoughts in the comments. If you remember, when I first approached this doll, the project took a turn and I ended up making Jade. Jade looks very Eastery and spring themed, although it was fall at the time. And look what happened with Luna here! We're headed into spring, but she looks much more like an autumn or early winter character. I really did these two dolls backwards, didn't I? Thank you so much for joining me! I hope you had fun watching our moth girl come together at long last. Just like old times, you can vote on the next Stockbox Dolls theme by clicking on that little info card in the upper right corner. That will give me a direction for the next doll, but like I stated at the beginning, I'll be designing it on the fly. Subscribe to get notified when I upload a new doll, and thank you for watching! I'll catch you next time! Stay artsy! Annyeong!